Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Green Business Fund Technical Webinar, Energy Procurement and Green Tariffs. So before we get started, um, I'd just like to go over a couple of things. So you've all joined in listen-only mode, but you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions throughout the presentation by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. Um, you can do this at any time in the presentation, but we will be collecting these questions and address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. And we'll also be sending around the slides to attendees after the webinar. So now I would like to introduce Henry Mellon from the Carbon Trust. Hi all, welcome to the webinar. Um, my name is Henry Mellon and I'm an analyst at the Carbon Trust in Business Services and I'll, I'll go into what that means and the Carbon Trust in a few minutes. Um, but yeah, welcome to this webinar on NGP and, and green tariffs. This is a green business fund webinar. For those who aren't aware, the green business fund is a scheme that's dedicated to supporting small and medium organisations in England, Scotland and Wales um, and for providing opportunities to improve energy efficiency and reduce costs. And this technical webinar, as well as the guide that will be published in association with this webinar later on this year, um, are just two of the support services that we provide as part of that fund. Um, and I will go into what the other services are at the end of this presentation. Um, so looking at the agenda for today, the first thing that we will cover um, is an introduction to the Carbon Trust um, and then look at where our energy actually comes from. And by energy, what we're going to be looking at is electricity and gas. Next, we'll go into energy procurement, and this is primarily focused on small and medium sized businesses, um, how you can do that in-house, and then also um, how you might contact an energy broker and the positives and negatives of doing this. We'll also look at uh, the prices in the UK and projections thereof for electricity and gas, as well as the different types of tariffs that are available um, and the positives and negatives of those. Um, penultimately, we'll look at organisational carbon footprinting and how um, looking into your energy use and the, the type of energy use um, that your organisation has uh, relates to footprinting and why perhaps it's becoming more important for small and medium sized businesses to look at this. And then finally, we will round up with um, a just description of the services that are available through the Green Business Fund. Um, so first of all, I'll talk through the Carbon Trust. So for those who are not aware, we're a not-for-profit organization with a mission to accelerate the move to a sustainable, low carbon economy. And we offer three main streams um, of service, which are advice, footprinting, um, and technology-related um, services. Um, with regards to our advice um, and footprinting, this is um, these are two streams of work which relate to business services, which is the division that I work within, um, which um, often relates to looking at the impact of different organizations, no matter what their size, so be it small and medium sized businesses or, or large organizations, um, and then using that information to determine different ways in which we can help them to reduce their emissions. And we also run schemes like the GBF, which fit under that advice um, section. Um, we also look um, at technology and um, help deploy low carbon technologies and solutions. And this relates to work within the UK as well as abroad um, in other countries around the world. Um, I mean, our two main divisions within the company are business services and also um, policy and innovation. And the business services team tends to look at, at businesses and corporates and policy and innovation team um, at governments and policy around the world. Um, a quick introduction to me also would be just that I work within business services. My work covers this area in helping organisations um, to try and procure renewable electricity to reduce their carbon footprints in the near future, um, as well as meet um, carbon reduction targets such as science-based targets which are being picked up much more frequently by businesses um, at the moment, which is really good to see. Um, so the first part of uh, my webinar, I'd like to go through where our energy actually comes from and 
I wanted to begin by looking at the UK's electricity generation um, from early on in the century, uh, the 20th century to present. Um, so what we're looking at here is gigawatt hours of electricity um, consumed and in terms of years, this does look up to 2017, although it doesn't show that on the um, X axis on the bottom. Um, and I think what's really clear to see probably from everyone is that um, electricity generation has risen considerably um, or did rise considerably throughout the 20th century and it actually ended up peaking in 2005 and since 2005 has uh, reduced somewhat. There's been a 15% decrease between 2005 and um, 2017 and there are a few reasons for that decrease such as the outsourcing of energy intensive industries to countries outside of our own borders um, a sort of shift that we're all seeing to a more service-based economy um, and then also the impact of environmental regulation and energy efficiency as well and the main drivers for the increase in consumption to begin with is, is definitely other factors such as population growth um, the increase in activity in industrial industries um, and so forth. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, current generation is um, around about uh, 330,000 gigawatt hours. Um, so that's the total consumption and now what I thought it would be good to do is, is go through what sources um, generate our electricity um, and, and look backwards um, over just a short period to to 2013. Um, the reason why I really wanted to do this is to emphasize the shift away from coal that we've been seeing in the UK electricity grid. So in 2013, which is only six years ago, um, coal was the main source of electricity in our grid, which as everyone knows is, is very, very dirty. Um, and in 2017, um, that had almost disappeared completely and it was only responsible for just over 20 thousand gigawatt hours um, the reason for the removal of coal is principally the e, one of the EU's directives um, which is looking to remove coal from our um, energy grid um, the EU's large combustion plant directive was designed to tackle air pollutants um, and as a result that a number of coal plants in the UK shut between 2012 and 2015 and following on from that the government has actually put in a, a pledge to remove all coal, all coal from our generating mix by 2025. Um, so that is coal. Um, the removal of coal has been compensated by a few other things such as the rise in use of natural gas and renewables. Um, so between 2013 and 2017, uh, the percentage of our electricity generated by gas um, which is the blue line at the top, rose by 11% um, and uh, by renewables by about 13%. Um, and what I mean by renewables there is, is thermal renewables, so any types of biomass, um, hydroelectricity from natural flow of water, uh, wind and solar. Um, and perhaps the other thing to note is that what other thermal relates to is um, thermal sources such as coke, oven gas, blast furnace gas and waste products um, from chemical processes. Um, the other things that we haven't spoken about are, are nuclear, um, oil um, and these sources haven't really changed over the last few years. Um, so now that we've looked backwards I think it would be great now to look forwards. Um, starting in 2017 and then shifting out towards 2030. Um, as we sort of remember from the previous slide, um, natural gas was our biggest contributor to electricity generation, um, followed by renewables and then nuclear. Um, and what we expect to see, um, well, what base, what the government expects to see as, as these are uh, their figures, is is that renewables is going to overtake natural gas in the near future um, and will become our most dom dominant source of electricity generation um, and, and gas will drop fairly significantly with, with nuclear remaining quite flat. Um, 
So gross electricity generated in 2017 was 338,649 gigawatt hours. Um, and what Bayes predicts is that by 2030, this is actually going to fall slightly um, to 320,104 gigawatt hours. And this is their reference scenario. They do actually publish a few other scenarios. Um, not everyone predicts that our total generation will decrease by 2030. Some believe it's actually going to increase um, as um, our heating demand for our homes shifts from gas boilers over to other technologies such as heat pumps that might be powered by electricity, as well as um, the need to power our electric vehicles. Um, but this is what Bayes predicts in their reference scenario. Um, in 2030, it's suggesting that 58% of generation um, will be renewable. Um, and again, by renewable, um, I'm referring to what I did previously, and that it includes thermal renewables, hydroelectricity from natural flow, wind, um, and solar. Uh, but I think both the, this slide and the previous slide show um, a fantastic and fascinating transition in our, in our grid mix, which um, has been long overdue. Firstly, the shift away from coal, and then, then the exciting prospect of renewables becoming our um, main source of electricity in the near future. Um, so now that we've talked about electricity, I now wanted to shift to gas, um, which isn't talked about, I would say, quite as much as electricity. Um, so when it comes to supply, um, similarly to looking at generation in backwards um, to the start of 20th century. I'd, I'd like to look at natural gas supply to back to 1998 and, and have a look at how much we've produced typically on our own um, and how much we've imported. And in this graph, imports have been split up by pipeline imports and LNG imports as well. And um, I think the story that this graph shows um, Again, as, as with the previous two slides, what we're looking at is gigawatt hours here and years on the x-axis. Um, I think the, the key thing here is that the UK is and has been becoming increasingly reliant on gas imports. Um, so the UK was, was once a net exporter of gas. Exports have been excluded from this graph, but the UK was once a net exporter of gas. Um, as recently as 2003, which is when this change occurred, and you can see that the indigenous production starts to decrease. Um, so in sort of, to counter that, um, we now actually almost import almost um, half of our gas. Um, and what that means is we're, we're quite reliant on those imports, or maybe reliance is the wrong word, but dependent on those imports and that um, the price of the gas that we procure outside of our own borders will affect gas prices in the UK. Um, so our pipeline imports primarily come from Norway, um, with 86% coming from Norway. Um, and in 2017, at least, we were also heavily reliant on Qatar for our LNG imports. 86% of um, the LNG imports came from Qatar that year too. So apologies, what I meant to say earlier was that from Norway, 85% um, came from pipeline imports. Um, in 2018, the UK did diversify its LNG imports somewhat in that only 41% came from Qatar, um, with the US making up um, some of that also. Um, so that's looking back at where we actually get our gas from. Um, I won't be showing any projections um, of that, but what I will show is um, what primary energy demand looks like moving forward um, for natural gas. And what Bayes predicts is that this is going to fall by 15% between 2018 and 2030. Um, and what this reflects is that natural gas will make up a smaller percentage of electricity generation, uh, mainly due to the uptake of renewables, as we've sort of heard to earlier. Um, the gas that is used to power um, electricity generating stations is included in this primary end demand graph. 
Um, and then the other thing will be the shift away from gas and domestic heating. So the government have recently pledged um, to ensure that all new homes built in 2025 will be electric only. Um, and I think that pledge came out after these statistics were published and may even have a further impact um, on these. Um, working with, with home builders, um, it's evident to see that electric only homes is going to have a huge impact on um, the emissions of their customers downstream. Um, so what does primary energy demand mean and what does it include? Well, it includes the consumption of the energy industry. Um, as I've just mentioned, um, losses during transmission and distribution of, of the energy, in this case, primary gas and final consumption by end users. But um, what we see here is that our demand is decreasing, which is a positive thing from a carbon perspective. Um, the final thing I wanted to touch upon, just as we have done with renewables in electricity, is green gas, um, which is becoming quite a hot topic amongst corporates, perhaps not small and medium-sized businesses. Um, and what this graph is looking at is the amount of green gas, which is biomethane. Biomethane tends to make up about 97% of green gas. Um, the amount of that that's injected into the grid and these statistics come from the government's renewable heat incentive scheme. Um, so may not cover all the green gas that has been injected into the grid, but um, you can be um, fairly sure that it covers most of it, given that anyone who's generating green gas will be um, incentivized to pick up the government incentive for doing so. Um, and I think what you can see here is that it has been rising pretty significantly over the last few years. So in 2014, next to no green gas was injected into the grid, um, whereas in 2018, that rose to 3,000 gigawatt hours, which to put into context, isn't very much for those who've been uh, paying attention to the y-axis on previous slides. It just accounted for 0.39% of the gas that was available at terminals. So it's very, very small. Um, even if this trend continues to rise, um, green gas isn't likely to make up a huge percentage of what's available in, in the grid. Um, but there is quite a lot of pressure in the corporate world to um, encourage um, further generators of this energy source. Um, so hopefully this, this does begin to rise exponentially rather than linearly. Um, I did mention the renewable heat incentive um, I'll talk about this a little bit further later. Um, this is something that I'm sure all of you will be aware of, um, is an incentive scheme that's both um, offered to domestic and non-domestic entities. Um, I think the final thing to mention is that green gas tariffs are becoming more mainstream and there are some suppliers who are looking at these like Ecotricity, NG, uh, Empower and Ovo. Um, but the supply is, of course, limited um, and there does tend to be a small premium on these tariffs also. Um, so I put in this slide on green gas and renewable electricity just to really firm up what these things mean, um, which I hope I've explained already. Um, but green gas is, is biomethane. Um, and can be produced from a number of sources, including biogas from anaerobic digestion, landfill gas and synthetic gas, which is also known as syngas, um, from the gasification of biomass. Um, and renewable electricity is electricity that's generated by renewable non-fossil sources. So these are wind, solar, hydropower, hydrothermal, biomass and other waste gases. And there's further information and in intricacies that relate to these when it comes to carbon accounting, which we will go through later, um, regarding certificates that are required to truly prove that your energy is green um, and it isn't just said to be green by the suppliers of that energy. Um, so I hope all of you found that relatively interesting regarding where our energy comes from, um, electricity and gas. Um, if you're interested in any of those figures, I'd direct you to the the government website for that. Um, there are a number of different sources of data and if, if you'd like specifics then please do get into contact with us and we can provide them to you. Um, the next thing we're going to cover in this webinar is energy procurement 
Um, and as I mentioned at the start of this webinar, what we're going to go into here is different types of, of tariff, um, the, the breakdown of your energy bill, um, how to source energy in-house or looking at energy brokers, um, and then final, finally, um, actual electricity and gas prices at current and, and uh, forward look thereof. Um, so regarding energy procurement, the, the first thing I wanted to discuss was the breakdown of energy bills, which is, is not something that everyone is entirely aware of, but um, is fundamentally important when it comes to looking at why our energy bills might be rising and increasing. Um, and on the left hand side here, I've got the breakdown of the gas bill and the right hand side, uh, an electricity bill and the key, which is on the far right hand side relates to both. So just cycling around the dark blue segment relates to the wholesale costs. Um, so the costs um, relating to what the supplier actually pays the generator for the electricity. Um, the next segment being the um, sort of fluorescent-ish green segment, this is the network costs. Um, the light blue is looking at the environmental and social obligation costs. The lighter blue, the other direct costs, green operating costs. Um, the beigey type colour segment is the supply pre-tax margin and then finally we're looking at that. Um, and we're actually going to look at each of these um, in turn over the next few slides. But Wholesale costs, um, what these relate to is how much supplies space to get the gas and electricity supply with energy. Um, there are certain things that affect this, such as when availability is high and demand is low, prices are usually lower too. Um, and global availability and demand for energy um, will also affect this um, because as we've sort of covered, not all our energy demands are met by our own generation and we do import some energy also. So um, I, I mentioned that 86% of our pipeline imports for gas come from Norway um, and um, a similar percentage came from Qatar for LNG. Um, what I didn't mention is that 6% of our electricity um, is imported. Also, we have connections hooked up to Ireland, the Netherlands and most recently this year, Belgium. So we are the only country that these other countries who are supplying us with energy supply um, and if there is demand elsewhere around the world it can result in increases in these imports which will then affect us um, and then there are other um, other factors which can affect wholesale costs as well regarding the generation of electricity here um, if you think about it from a renewable perspective um, if we have a particularly um, non-sunny summer or so forth then solar generation is going to be lower and if we are heavily reliant on wind for electricity and the wind doesn't blow um, then again we will have um, a gap to, to fill in terms of um, energy generation. Um, the next thing being the network costs um, so I guess one thing I didn't touch upon was the percentages um, wholesale costs uh, relate to 39.02% of the gas bill and 33.52% of the electricity bill and network costs uh, 20 account for 25.42% of our gas bills and 25.46% of electricity bills and network costs um, what these are are the costs for maintaining and using the UK gas and electricity networks, which might be the pipes um, or wires in, in the sense of electricity. But I guess also the physical hardware that's required to actually balance those grids. Um, so there are other entities involved um, in maintaining and managing the supply and demand of gas and electricity, which we'll discuss later, who look at the software side of things. Um, but there is also the hardware that needs to account for that. Um, the next thing to cover on the pie would be the environmental and social obligation costs, which is in light blue and the key, and are, are fairly small in the case of the gas bill and, and much higher in terms of the electricity bill. Um, and this essentially relates to government programmes, um, and there are a number of these. Um, which I can go through if necessary. 
um, but the purpose of these programs is to save energy and encourage the uptake of renewable energy and also support customers in vulnerable circumstances. So one of these programs that we've already discussed is the renewable heat incentive, um, but there are others also such as the feed-in tariff, which encourages uptake of small renewable low carbon electricity generation, um, the renewables obligation scheme, which is a main support scheme for large scale renewable electricity generation in the UK, um, which puts an obligation on licensed electricity suppliers to source a proportion of their supply from renewables. Um, the Renewable Energy Guarantees Origin Scheme, which is a certificate scheme to prove that um, your electricity, um, if it is said to be green, really is green and it enables you to account it um, in your carbon accounting, which we'll discuss later. And then um, finally, from the top of my head, the climate change, the levy exemption um, is also one of these um, environmental and social obligation costs. Um, what that is, is a tax on UK business use, um, which is charged at the time of supply. Um, but if you generate your electricity from certain renewable sources, um, if you had done, should I say before 1st of August 2015, um, you would have been exempt from the climate change levy also. Um, so other direct costs, um, this links into um, the network costs, which we've already described regarding um, both the source of the maintenance of our existing networks as well as the balancing of supply and demand in terms of the hardware that's used. Elexon and Exoserve are two companies that actually manage this software um, behind balancing supply and demand. Um, so Exoserve manage uh, the gas supply and demand. So um, what they do is they, they manage a central register which which looks at which companies are responsible for amounts of gas entering and leaving the network and ensure um, that this remains in balance um, between supply and demand and then um, Elexon is uh, responsible for um, supply and demand of electricity um, they actually uh, manage the balancing and settlement code which um, contains the government's arrangements for electricity balancing and settlement in Great Britain. Um, and what that does is, is it allows parties to, to basically make submissions to the national grid to either buy or sell electricity into or out of the market um, at close to real time. Um, so both of these, um, both of these entities provide um, instrumental roles and there are costs associated to these um, which land on the supplier and then end up landing on us too, um, everyone who pays their energy bills. Um, also including another direct cost might be broker costs um, and intermediaries, sales commissions, and then also smart metering costs. For example, the costs related to government appointed um, companies for data communications between smart meters and suppliers. Um, next would be the operating costs, so these in the sense of our gas bills relate to 19.58% of our gas bill and with regards to electricity 17.15% and these refer to the operating costs of the supplier itself, um, so the all the cash that's required to keep the entity going, um, fund its metering, billing um, and sales services. Um, Last but not least would be the supplier pre-tax margin, which is fairly large in the sense of a gas bill at 8.68% um, and much smaller with regards to electricity at 0.4%. Um, and what this is, is the difference between the money an energy company receives from their customers and their operating costs. It's not equivalent to an energy company's profit since they have to pay tax. Um, fund debt payments and deal with other costs um, and I think a key point to note here is that suppliers will look to make a profit um, they are private entities um, but the supplier pre-tax margin is regulated by Ofgem so that this doesn't um, fly out of control the final thing would be VAT um, which is applied to the consumption 
of goods and services across Britain. Um, so what I wanted to go through next was electricity and retail price projections. Um, so hopefully the previous few slides have given us all an example of um, what our energy bill costs are actually going towards. Um, and to, to me, they, they really emphasize all the different types of stakeholders that are involved in supplying energy. I think it's a common conception of, of people, perhaps not businesses, um, that the supplier is responsible for energy in its entirety, be it generation and supply. Um, but that just isn't the case. There are a number of different stakeholders involved on both the wholesale side, the supplier side, and then many other support functions um, to that. Um, looking at uh, gas and electricity retail prices, um, what these two graphs look at is, is different sectors. So on the left hand side is price per kilowatt hour and on, on the X axis is years and this is split up to the, into the, the industrial, um, residential services and transport sectors for electricity and then for gas, industrial, residential and services. Um, before we sort of look at projections moving forward, it's probably very key to note that electricity is much more expensive than gas, um, which is fairly common knowledge. Um, and this is this is quite interesting when um, replacing um, gas powered technologies with electricity powered technologies. Um, if the electricity powered technologies are not sufficiently efficient, um, then it can end up being more expensive um, for small and medium sized businesses or commercial entities to replace gas technologies with electricity technologies. Um, this, this very much depends on the circumstances, um, but the positive of electricity technologies is that they're powered by electricity and as we've seen, um, the carbon intensity of the grid is, is decreasing very, very quickly, um, whereas you can't um, remove the carbon aspect from burning gas. Um, looking forward um, in terms of electricity, there are price rises expected. Um, they do differ somewhat across each of the sectors, um, but by 2030 is expected that there's going to be around about a 10% rise in electricity costs, um, which perhaps isn't emphasized best by, by this graph and that it looks quite flat. Um, the, the main signals the government highlights for these is that the cost of transporting um, transporting energy is, is set to rise. Um, so I guess what we mean by that is is transporting gas and transporting electricity. Um, with regards to electricity, we've got this challenge relating to managing supply and demand and with renewable sources, which aren't necessarily as reliable um, as fossil sources. Um, but then there's also the fact that um, fossil sources are now starting to become frowned upon and being taxed more heavily. Um, and the final thing would be that a number of coal plants have closed, closed down and these plants did provide cheap energy. Um, and whilst the cost of renewables are sinking fast, um, they are currently in the UK, at least um, slightly higher than um, you'd expect from a gas plant or a coal plant previously. Um, so with regards to gas, we're expecting quite a high rise um, by 2030, um, higher in the services and industrial sectors than the residential sector, um, but increases nonetheless of 22% for the industrial sector, 11% for the residential sector, and 31% for, for services, um, which I think puts a large emphasis on managing energy consumption for all businesses and all end users um, and looking to find ways in which to reduce that. Um, reducing energy consumption, um, the only reason for that is, is not to reduce carbon emissions. It also provides cost savings, um, which is definitely one of the drivers we try to use in our work um, when encouraging um, different kinds of businesses to make um, energy um, investment um, and shouldn't be overlooked. So now what I'm going to move into is, is types of tariffs. 
um, and looking at how small and medium sized businesses might procure energy in house um, before we do finally move over to organisational footprinting. Um, how that's impacted by the types of sources that you use to power your, your generation and activities um, and then the Green Business Fund and, and different services there. Um, one thing that Susan and I did mention at the start of the presentation was, is that we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the session um, and we hopefully should have some time for that given that we've got 23 minutes remaining in this webinar. Um, so in terms of types of tariffs, um, there are a number of different types of tariffs and what I've picked out here is the main ones. Um, there are fixed term tariffs, variable rate tariffs, time of use tariffs and green tariffs also. What a uh, fixed term tariff is, is one that gives a specific set price for the cost of energy per kilowatt hour. Um, so this doesn't mean that you pay the same amount for your energy per month. It does vary with your consumption, but the price per kilowatt hour is fixed. A variable rate tariff, um, these types of tariffs are also known as standard tariffs or evergreen tariffs. And the price you pay per kilowatt hour of gas or electricity on this tariff dependent on its market value. So it will rise and fall with um, things such as wholesale costs um, and other factors that we described earlier on in the presentation. Um, the next would be a time of use tariff. So a time of use tariff um, alters the price of your gas or electricity depending on the time when you use them. Um, these are becoming more mainstream. Um, a number of suppliers are offering that now, but um, in the new, near future, I think we should expect these to become very common um, as uh, electric vehicles become more mainstream um, in our lives um, and lots of people are looking to charge them overnight um, and so on. Um, and we'll talk through the positives and negatives of, of that on the next slide. And then finally, green tariffs, um, which are or should be fairly self-explanatory in that a green tariff is, is one where the supplier matches your consumption with the generation of electricity or gas from renewable sources. Um, this, this does get quite difficult in that some suppliers actually um, flag some of their tariffs as green when they're not entirely backed by renewable electricity or gas. Um, so one key thing to look for here is that it is backed by REGOs, which are renewable um, energy generation um, offsets, and then RUGOs, which are the same thing for gas. Um, and we will discuss those a little bit later. Um, there are pros and cons to using each of these tariffs. Um, fixed term tariffs tend to be the cheapest. Um, it will depend who, who you go with, which supplier you use. Um, but they are typically cheaper than other, other tariffs. Um, and the benefit to fixed term tariffs is that you're protected against any rises in energy consumption, energy prices, sorry. Um, the, the flip side to that is that you won't feel the benefit if energy prices are cut. And these tariffs tend to have exit fees, which will scale on the price of your contract, um, but can be fairly expensive. The, the next thing would be the variable rate tariff. Um, so as described, this will increase or decrease depending on market value, which means that you will feel the benefit um, if energy prices are cut. But on the flip side, um, if energy prices rise, you'll be hurt by this. Um, there don't tend to be any exit fees with these tariffs, um, but they do tend to be slightly more expensive than other tariffs. Um, and definitely usually more expensive than fixed term tariffs. Next will be time of use tariffs. Um, so as described in the previous slide, these tariffs um, offer different prices per kilowatt hour of electricity or gas, depending on the time of day, um, which if you're in a position where you can actually decide when you use your energy, um, can be a great thing for you. Um, but if not, and you tend to use energy when prices are high, then it definitely isn't a positive option and you should try to avoid it as um, electricity um, bills are likely to rise. And then finally, um, green tariffs. 
Um, so green tariffs um, operate um, very similarly to fixed term tariffs. Um, and they offer the prospect for a price reduction in some cases if you're on a variable rate tariff. Uh, they do tend to be a little bit more expensive than fixed term tariffs that are non-green, um, but can often be cheaper than variable rate tariffs. Um, so are a good option if you're on an expensive variable rate tariff. Um, the positive and negatives do relate to fixed term tariffs also though as they are similar and that you won't feel the benefit um, if energy prices are cut um, but you're protected against any rises in energy prices and there are some exit fees um, associated with these types of tariffs um, so hopefully that gives everyone a fairly clear explanation of the the principal types of tariffs that are available um, and what we'd like to discuss now is actually procuring energy. Um, so I think I was reading one article recently which said that most businesses spend less than six minutes a year um, looking at energy procurement, which is a very, very short amount of time. Um, and that most likely relates to businesses who use energy brokers. Um, it will take a little bit longer if you decide to do it in-house. Um, as the comment says in the bottom of the slide, um, if you if you can, you probably should, um, but energy brokers are another option. Um, the reason why um, you perhaps should is that you can spend more time than an energy broker might do, and after a few years, you'll familiarize yourself with the process um, and be very apt at it. But, if doing it in-house, there are four steps to this that you should uh, consider. So number one should be, you must understand your energy spend. Um, so how much do you currently pay for electricity and gas? Um, and perhaps how, how does that vary by month? Um, are you affected by seasonal changes? Um, and then secondly, are you planning to make any significant changes to your business? So this might be sudden growth or a change in premises that may be more or less energy intensive. Um, the reason why that's necessary is because it, it's key when it comes to negation, negotiations with your existing supplier or um, if you're to chat to other energy suppliers also. Um, so that is the first step. The second step would be to speak to your exist, existing supplier. Um, so your supplier, unless nudged, um, may not disclose that they have a cheaper energy tariff. Um, if, if you're on a default or deemed energy contract, then energy suppliers are obligated to inform you about this, but you might not necessarily be on a default or deemed contract. Um, I think this is much um, as is the case with telephone contracts. Um, unless you get into contact with your supplier, often you're paying more than you need to. Um, and you can um, achieve significant reductions in, in energy costs, which is very important if your business is particularly energy intensive. Um, the third thing would then be to, to I guess, take that on board, um, the best tariff that your supplier is able to give you, and then review average business energy prices online. So unlike when it comes to domestic procurement, where you can look online at a number of different ready-made um, tariffs um, and you can compare them against one another it's a bit different in the case of businesses you actually have to speak to them you have to let them know your spend um, let them know your plans um, and discuss the best price for you um, and there are tables that are available which you can match um, the price you've perhaps received from your existing supplier against and keep in mind when you chat to other energy suppliers which is the next step um, to see that you're in the right ballpark. Um, so as mentioned, the next step would be to then go to speak to other energy suppliers and speaking to as many suppliers as possible um, is definitely the best thing to do. Um, the quotes that they provide you with will vary um, and you should you should get a, a great body of quotes um, or the, the greatest body of quotes that you're able to. Um, and you may find that one of these suppliers offers you a much better quote than your existing supplier. If that is the case, then you are in a position to either go back to your existing supplier or the other suppliers who haven't 
provided you with as competitive quotes um, and try and negotiate them down. Um, the negative to all this is that it can be a time intensive process um, and if you feel as though you don't have the time to do this you can offload it to an energy broker which is the next slide. Um, so working with energy brokers can be a very positive experience um, with preferable rates being received. I mean, if you're going to an energy broker, you have to be mind, you have to bear in mind that you are paying them for their service. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they can't get you a better quote. Um, it will just mean that it is perhaps not as good as if you went out and did it yourself, um, but there is a time element to that. Um, when working with energy brokers, we do think that there are a few key questions that you should ask from them um, to essentially sense check and um, run a litmus test on how good the services they're providing you with are. Um, so the first question would be, can the broker ensure to you that they are constantly monitoring the market? Um, is is the quote that um, you receive from them the best out there? Um, or could you actually find a better quote yourself? Um, the next thing would be, is your broker providing you with an even comparison between energy tariffs? Um, so is he purely or is he or she purely providing you with um, fixed rate tariffs or standard rate tariffs? Are you getting a good variety of tariffs to choose from? Um, do you feel as though green tariffs are being neglected? Um, these things are very important and in each of those cases it's, it's important that the best tariff available is also present in that category. Um, the next question would be how is the broker generate pro profit from the, from the provision of their services? Um, there have been some cases where energy brokers have been tied to specific suppliers, but I guess this is also important just so that you can understand um, if there's an incentive for them to get you the best deal possible. Um, and then finally, the last question would be, does the broker provide services beyond those related to energy procurement? Um, for example, some energy brokers Brokers provide ESOS services, free ESOS services for those organisations that are large enough, um, and energy and monitor, energy monitoring and management services also, um, which are very important if you're looking to report your carbon footprint. Um, which is what we're going to come to now on organisational carbon footprinting. Um, we're going to quickly go through the next couple of questions um, to try and ensure that we finish on time um, but we've got 12 minutes 10 minutes to do so so we should be okay um, when it comes to organizational carbon footprinting this is becoming much more important for large businesses but um, I think as a small and medium sized business you may wonder why it's important to you um, there are reasons why it is for example it would help you to understand your key energy emissions sources if you actually uh, calculate your carbon footprint um, and it would also help you determine your impact to um, global emissions and how you contribute to them, which is likely to be small, but it's, it's nice to put that into perspective and perhaps compare your emissions against um, common metrics such as how many barrels of oil have been burned or how many homes uh, might produce the same amount of emissions in a year. Um, the third point would be to identify and prioritise areas for reducing um, emissions. Um, often energy reduction initiatives result in cost savings because if you're saving energy, you're saving money put towards them, there's always a return of investment case associated with these. Um, so if you can work out what your key sources of energy consumption are, you can, you can target them um, and look to um, actually generate your, your company some cash in the near future. And then finally, it's becoming more and more common for large entities um, to request that suppliers up and down their value chain report their carbon footprint also. So this is um, featuring more commonly on um, procurement documents. It's actually something that we encourage um, companies to do um, to try and help them reduce their emissions up and down the value chain, which they're required to report as well. Um, 
current trends suggest that carbon reporting is likely to become a necessity of all organizations um, in the near future respect irrespective of size um, so in the early noughties it became required um, that quoted companies had to actually report their emissions um, through mandatory carbon reporting and that was extended recently to large companies um, and limited liability partnerships um, through streamlined energy and carbon reporting. Um, I, I think what's clear here is that the government's requiring more and more people to report on their carbon um, and it will likely become a requirement for all businesses just as financial accounts are. Um, the next thing to discuss would be what is actually included in your carbon footprint um, and this graphic here is inspired from the Greenhouse Gas Protocol um, Corporate Accounting and Reporting Standard, which is the de facto standard when reporting carbon emissions. There are a number of different areas which are included on this, um, but the only ones that are particularly important, maybe for a small and medium sized business, but um, even for larger companies at the moment, are scope one and two emissions, which are, they relate to an organization's energy use. If absolutely everyone on the planet, every company, every country was to report their scope one and two emissions, then that would account for all emissions that existed. Um, scope three emissions um, come into play to look at what a company's wider impact is. Um, scope three emissions aren't required by law in the UK for um, large unquoted companies and limited liability partnerships or quoted companies at the moment. Um, and when large companies are actually looking at the emissions up and down their um, value chain, they only look to see what those companies um, are generating in terms of their scope one two emissions as well. So these, this should be the focus, your organizational um, carbon emissions. There are two scopes. Um, that relate to organisational carbon emissions, which are scope one and scope two. In scope one, you have the emissions from burning fuels, which may relate to um, consumption, um, your transport um, and process and fugitive emissions are also included within that. And then scope two relates to purchase electricity. So although the emissions from your energy consumption may not um, actually be released on site, um, it's important that these are taken into account um, and they are so in scope two. Um, there, is, um, there is a specific piece of, of methodology when it comes to reporting to scope two emissions, so the emissions relating from your electricity. Um, there are two methods, um, there's a location-based method and a market-based method. What the location-based method does is use a factor that's specific to the country that you're in, not necessarily the electricity that you buy, whereas market-based does relate to the electricity that you purchase. Um, so if you are purchasing gas or electricity from a green tariff, and this is backed by renewable certificates, then you are able to account um, this consumption as zero. Um, whereas in the location-based approach, you will be using the emissions factor that's separate to that. Um, and that is what I've described here, um, which I think I should probably skip through now just so that we can get through to the last few slides on the Green Business Fund. Um, all that essentially said is that exactly what I just said, your consumption, um, if from a green tariff, has to be backed by renewable certificates. There are specific schemes for this, um, which you should look into, um, which are the renewable gas guarantees of origin um, and also the green gas certification scheme. So please refer to those sources if you'd like to learn more about that. Um, the Green Business Fund. Um, so we started the presentation with the Green Business Fund and I mentioned that this is a scheme that's dedicated to small and medium sized organisations um, in the UK. Um, and it's aimed to provide opportunities to improve energy efficiency and reduce energy costs. Um, it's available to um, schools, sole traders and charities on top of small and medium sized businesses. And to be qualified as a small and medium sized business, you have to meet two of the criteria that are met on the right hand bubble, which are you must have no more than 250 employees 
your annual turnover uh, must not be in excess of 25.9 million or your annual balance sheet um, should not be in excess of 12.9 and um, not more than 25% of your company should be owned by an entity which doesn't meet those criteria. Um, there are a number of services available, the first of which is energy efficiency training, which are essentially two hour workshops run by us up and down the country um, where we help um, all different types of stakeholders understand their energy consumption, um, identify no and low cost measures um, and there's two which are taking place in the near future, one on the 12th of September in Newcastle and one on the 2nd of October in Aldershot. Um, I think as with any of these services it's definitely working, worth looking at the Carbon Trust website um, for this, for the Green Business Fund, which is carbontrust.com slash green business fund. Two more services that we provide are energy assessments and implementation advice. Um, so an energy assessment would be either a remote or on-site assessment delivered by one of our engineers who would look at where you're consuming energy at present um, and opportunities to reduce that. They will actually provide three costed energy saving recommendations um, as well as a tailored appraisal of energy management approach. This is definitely something you should look to do um, and it would help that carbon footprinting process if you were looking to do it and that all your energy would, would be logged. Um, carbon figures would also be produced throughout that report um, and most importantly you'd be given measures to actually carry out to reduce money um, reduce costs within your organization. Um, sort of on top of that um, stream of advice, we also provide implementation advice and that takes energy assessments one step further in that after an energy assessment, you may have some costed um, opportunities for energy um, saving measures. During implementation advice, that engineer would then help you actually walk through that process. So contact suppliers who may have the technologies that are required to, to meet those needs um, and actually look through those quotes for you and ensure that you are getting a very good quote. Of course, if the cost of the project is lower, then you're likely to get a quicker return of investment um, and save money more quickly. Um, a further two services are the technical webinars and publications which we provide, um, which I mentioned at the start of this webinar. So this is a technical webinar. Uh, which helps people to learn more about energy, um, get a better understanding for the business case towards attacking carbon um, and energy. Um, and then often publications are associated to these webinars. So um, there is a, a guide on energy procurement um, and uh, green electricity and gas, which is being written at the moment, which is going to be published later this year, which if you found this webinar at all interesting, you should definitely have a look at. Um, Last but not least, something else that we are beginning to provide is energy saving tools. Um, so all of these are available to use on the Carbon Trust website, but we've got a tool that actually helps you measure your carbon footprint. So that relates to um, the type of information that we've discussed today. Uh, um, benchmark your energy use and also build your business case for lighting upgrades. Um, these tools have step by step instructions and guidelines. Um, and um, are definitely worth having a look at, also available on the Carbon Trust website. And then finally, the Green Business Directory is another source of advice of companies which we have um, certified as carrying out a positive service and companies that have shown to us they have a track record in helping organisations reduce their energy consumption. Um, it is an accreditation scheme, but um, we value it very highly um, and every supplier on this list is, is someone that can do a very good job in um, helping you to carry out any energy um, reduction project you might have in line. Um, often this ties into the implementation advice and remote assessments that we provide for clients in that when we um, recommend suppliers for companies to work with, um, they often appear from this directory. So that closes the webinar. Um, apologies that I had to rush through those final slides at the end. Um, and unfortunately, we won't have any time to go through questions. But we have logged 
um, all your questions um, on the WebEx app and um, I, Susan, am I able to, to respond to them directly? Um, yeah. Okay, so we do have your email addresses so I can respond um, to those questions if they haven't already been covered. Um, but thanks very much for your time um, and I hope you have a lovely day and also take a look at the guide associated to this webinar when it comes out later this year.